I wanted to mention real quick that I'm going to be inserting some pictures because what made me decide to do this video is that my mother's neighbor, where my mom lives, um, is, um, is at hospice house. She's terminal. And it all started with a fall. So I will be doing a video on falls. But that's where she's at. She's peaceful and uh, she's getting just amazing care around the clock at Hospice House. And she had a lot of information and directives and uh, requests before she was transferred there. And all of those wishes are being met. But I brought my mom yesterday and we stayed for a couple hours. So. three requirements for hospice. So how you get hospice care is a provider has to write an order, just like they write an order for anything else. Um, the order would be that the patient has met the requirements for hospice care, and then the order is, is written, is given, and then the referral is sent to hospice. In a lot of places, hospice and palliative care work together, and other places they don't. Like there are hospice houses, and that is for the patients that have that order going directly over to a hospice house. So in order to get into hospice, a patient has to have decided that they are done with curative treatments, such as chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery, and other things. Even if they want to try all kinds of treatments that they go to Mexico for, that they read about online, if the patient has decided they are still actively trying to get into remission and be cured, they don't, uh, they're not a candidate for hospice. Um, once the disease has been shown to have uh, progressed and they are terminal and it is shown through <clears throat> MRIs, CAT scans, labs, that sort of thing, and the person has decided to not pursue curative treatments, they also need to be, a pro it's hard to tell, but they say in the United States, in most states, approximately six months to live or less to be eligible for hospice. I want to mention that the reason um, I'm saying a diagnosable, a diagnosed illness, like isn't that normal? But no, there are people who want to not be alive anymore and they want to have the care of hospice and they want to be treated with high dose narcotics uh, and they, uh, you know, that's a different situation. So sometimes people will say, how do I, how do I get to hospice or how do I get the um, end of life care in whatever way they want to do it? Um, but they do have to have a terminal illness. They can't just say they are that depressed or that they feel they have a terminal illness. It has to be proven. Now the requirements for palliative care um, you can be on palliative care if you have a serious or chronic medical condition. You don't have to be in the time frame at the very end of life, although you can. Palliative care can be given to somebody and started and uh, be offered to somebody at the beginning of their illness. So if somebody's diagnosed with MS or somebody has heart disease or um, something such as that, uh, you can have palliative care. It, um, that team will help with pain management, symptom management, uh, communication with a provider. It has been shown that people who are on palliative care with their chronic illnesses, and I'll use the example again of say heart disease, they have uh, tend to have less hospitalizations and they get out of the hospital sooner. They have a team of people that are working with them um, and that team, that team is going to help out and communicate with the rest of the people on the team. It's okay, Noah, what's, hang on, what's an example of a chronic illness, hypertension, chronic kidney disease, diabetes? Okay, where was I? Palliative care is based on need and not prognosis. And with palliative care, the patient is continuing to seek curative treatments. They are actively in a treatment protocol. They might have six more months to go. They might have years, years to go. Um, and so you can have palliative care early on. You have social workers, a case manager or two, however many are assigned to that palliative care clinic team. You um, could have spiritual care, music therapy, all kinds of different things are there for you to help you along with your disease management and, and alleviate some of the stress and questions that you might have.
how is it paid for? So it's paid by insurance, but um, usually when people become terminal and maybe have months to live and have stopped all of their curative treatments, then, um, then, medic then they are usually eligible for Medicaid. So then Medicaid would pay for palliative care in hospice. And remember, you can get palliative care anytime. And the other thing that a lot of people don't know is the big question is, well, once I choose hospice, well, that's it. You know, no, that is not. You can switch back and forth. If you, you, it's your life, it's your body. You can switch. If you decide to be on palliative care and then you've, you've tried different things and you feel you're ready for hospice, you talk about it with your team, you get switched to hospice, but then something new comes around the corner or immunotherapy comes around, you wanna try that. You get off hospice and the order goes back to palliative care and there's your team again. So there are some myths that I just want to say out loud, um, the, another myth is that people think, well, once I say I want to go, I'm, I'm okay with hospice or the family members have decided if the patient is too critically ill, family members have decided on hospice. Well, then we can't give them any more ice chips, no, you know, no care. What if they decide they want a drink of water? What if they decide that they want something? Um, People tend to think that hospice um, means you don't get anything anymore, and that is not true. What's true is you don't get tr curative treatment measures anymore, but if you decide to do that, remember, go off hospice, go back on palliative care. But um, when you're on hospice, if you decide that you want different things in your life, or you can make plans ahead of time, and you can have whatever you want. So here's another myth that uh, you lose all choices when you go on hospice. That's not true either. So ahead of time, if possible, but it's not always possible, it's good to talk about these things. What would you want, mom? Or um, have, you, have you thought about this? Can we talk about this? Um, do you want somebody to stay with you all, at all times? Do you think that even if somebody is not spiritual, but at the very end of their life when they're at hospice or they're in palliative care, they can change their mind and they can say, I've decided I want a chaplain. I've decided I want prayers. I decided I want someone to come in and sing to me. I've decided I want a priest. Whatever it is that that patient wants, they still have rights. They don't get into hospice or hospice house and just, you know, everybody is cookie cutter. It's the same thing for everybody. It's not, it's okay to ask for whatever it is that you want. Hospice and palliative care teams are amazing humans. They are, uh, they're giving of their heart and soul for somebody who is at the end of their life or who has a chronic disease. And it's okay, so I mentioned who pays for this. So if you're eligible, you get on Medicaid, please always consult with your case manager or social worker about those sorts of questions. They will help you. You are not on your own to figure it out because it's really complicated. And um, that's the last thing that you or any family member needs to be dealing with um, is fighting with insurance or how is this paid for? I've decided, here's another thing, I've decided I'm not gonna do palliative care because I'm sure I can't afford it you probably can afford it uh, because it's usually, it's covered by insurance. Medicare, Medicaid, insurance, private pay, it, it's covered. Somebody will help you work that detail out. But please don't feel that you don't get or deserve the treatment that you want or questions that you wanna ask or things that you need because you're so afraid that it's not gonna get covered by insurance. Is there such a thing as perinatal palliative care and hospice? Perinatal meaning uh, the time of early pregnancy, during pregnancy, after pregnancy, baby in the neonatal ICU and mom. What if mom has a terminal illness uh, and she's pregnant? She can have palliative care. She can have hospice care. Um, how about if the mom is pregnant and the baby, ha it's been determined that the baby has something like anencephaly, for example, does not have full development of the brain, is not going to live. There are so many, many, many conditions that um, neonate babies have uh, that are in the NICU or that moms find out during pregnancy that their baby has. And then uh, palliative care is offered for mom and baby to decide what they're going to do with this little baby. So baby gets palliative care, pediatric palliative care and hospice goes on, hospice house. Uh, palliative care can be given um, at an adult family home, at a home, um, at um, wherever the person is living. I was gonna say homeless and that's true, sad but true. A lot of patients are homeless and um, that doesn't mean you still, you're not gonna be able to get any care. Uh, you can get care. Why would somebody be denied hospice or palliative care when the order has been written? 
um, and has been, and the referral has been sent over to that department. Most of the time it has to do with documentation errors or signature errors. Uh, don't give up. So if something happens and you hear about that, let your nurse know, let your doctor know, let your social worker know. There's a whole team of people um, even before you get, of course, to palliative care, you've got a team of people in the, say, oncology department or the neonatal ICU, uh, the pediatric department. There's always somebody that can help you. And if you still have questions, um, put your questions below. I'm not an expert on this. I've, I've worked with death and dying, though, my entire career. Um, I've worked with children who are on hospice and palliative care and family members. Um, and then I have personal friends. So I wanted to speak about that a little bit too because, um, you know, having personally in, uh, dealing with it yourself uh, with a family member or a good friend um, is something that you'll never forget. It doesn't have to be a scary and just frightening, upsetting experience. There are nearly 9,000, I believe, hospice and palliative care centers. Uh, in the United States right now as of last year's count, but they are continuing to go up because more people um, are not dying in the hospital. Then we've got that whole thing about, you know, low staffing and what to do with that patient. But also it's more comfortable to be in a hospice house and have hospice care. All right, so let me speak maybe about somebody who lived right there next door to me. I'll find a picture of him. He was one of my best friends and a very young person. Um, he asked me to be his medical power of attorney, and of course I said yes. So that that abdominal pain and back pain that he was going to a chiropractor for was actually stage three and then four of prostate cancer. He then went in for surgery, and from that surgery date forward w was um, unable to walk and was a quadriplegic. He continued to be in absolute denial of his illness and how bad it was. When he was at stage four, uh, I don't care that I'm at stage four, I don't want to hear it, uh, I'm not going to die. When he would be hospitalized for sepsis and when it was time to go to hospice, he refused. Uh, he accepted palliative care, but he wasn't going to do that last step. He was just absolutely not going to do it. But anyway, when the time came that he was transferred from uh, the hospital, after many admissions, um, he then went to Hospice House. There aren't that many where I live. I wish there were more, and there probably will be more coming up in the future. Um, but a lot of hospice teams go to the home, but many people don't want hospice or a person to die, a loved one to die in the home or whatever the patient wants. So he decided that he finally said okay to hospice, and he got over there. They get, people get transferred by ambulance, and usually there's a back door and a back entrance, and that's how the patients come in. Um, and I stayed with him until his absolute last breath, and his daughter was there with him. Um, some amazing nurses were there, and his sisters came as well. His daughter at the very end wanted to lay in bed with him, and that's okay. Remember, you can do whatever you want. You can touch that person, speak to them, play their favorite music, read to them. Have somebody come in and um, play their favorite song on a guitar. Have a singer come in who's a friend. Whatever you think that that person would want. So she laid in bed with him at the very end. Uh, narcotics were started. I believe at that time it was morphine. And then he did have medication at Ativan for agitation. It's very common to get opioids. And please don't worry about my loved one is going to have a bad side effect or get addicted. Um, or why can't we just l let them go? Well, maybe you can just let them go without any intervention of medications. But some patients need it, especially if they have really large tumors or they're very ill or they've got active infections going on. Um, they're in pain, bone pain, um, metastasis to the brain, something that is causing them to be dis in discomfort. The hospice uh, house team is going to help keep that person comfortable. And oftentimes by this point, they do need IV narcotics. They will adjust it. They are experts in this, and they will adjust it according to what uh, your loved one needs. And it was adjusted for him. It was up when he was becoming more agitated. He experienced a lot of um, swelling in his feet, and that's normal. And he experienced um, not discoloration with his skin, but he did experience a lot of profuse sweating, and that can happen too. You're going to see some unusual symptoms 
um, and that's okay. Just ask your nurse about that, ask the provider. But most of the time, these symptoms are, are okay and normal. They have things to treat the patient, though. If you're finding my loved one is getting really, really agitated, just let the team know and they'll give you, him or her something. That goes the same for children too. Again, at home, anybody at home or anybody in the hospice house. Now, um, with back to him, what was really cool at hospice house is we wanted all the spiritual care for him. Um, and he's not opposed to that sort of thing. So we had just an amazing time. We all were around his bed. We had these bells. We had um, um, oils. Um, what am I trying to say? Scented oils. And we each went around with the oils around his bed and we put our hand in the oils and then we touched whatever part of our, his body we wanted to touch. And we said whatever we wanted to say to that person, um, to him this, in, in this situation. The lights were dimmed really low. He was completely comfortable. Um, and I remember for me, I touched his chest. I just put the oil all on his chest. He had all his covers off because he was sweating so much. Um, he was his privacy is still given um, and so he was covered on the lower part but I touched his chest I rubbed the oil in and I leaned in and told him what a good friend he was and how much I was gonna miss him because the time that my husband was in Iraq for a year and a half and then back back and forth and training and so forth it's he over there that helped me he that over here cleared out all the ice and snow because my son Nathan was so young at that time he'd see me carrying him he wanted to have a place where they could play he went to the thrift store with me and got the table that I've had for the last 15 years yeah so this was a while ago he got it home for me he he just was a wonderful human and a wonderful friend and um, he would be so proud of his daughter she now is married and has two children the other person I wanted to talk about is a little bit of a different situation. So what happens when somebody is at home and hospice comes in? Now each state, is, as I learned, is going to be a little bit different. So what hospice looked like here in my state when I went down to California and helped with somebody who was at home and hospice was brought in for her at home, um, it was completely different. There's no IV. It was sub well, it was all oral until the person. It's hard sometimes for them to swallow at the at the end of their life, or they're sedated an awful lot. You don't want them to choke. You you might trickle a little bit of the liquid medication in their cheek, but there is a point where you need either IV or a different way of administering the medication. So in her case, um, this was an adult as well, and in her case, it was given. Uh, sub Q and I can't remember it was on a pump I believe it was just underneath here in the abdomen I would say to with hospice at home the family members in my opinion do are expected to do way too much um, so just be aware of that family members in hospitals have to do a lot too but if you're if your loved one is at home like she was at home and it was a I think that from the time hospice started she passed away was I want to say seven or ten days I can't remember but um but like I said, I was there to help out the family, and I I jumped right in. So if you're if you're a nurse or you're a doctor, you're going to be there to help them if they if they need your help. But I felt bad. I don't think it's right that um, an RN will come in and do the initial assessment and then give you your the bag of medication with instructions. Most of the time, that goes in the refrigerator. If you need us for supplies or other things, give us a call. And and there was nobody nobody until the very end when pain management was too difficult and then an LPN came for probably the last maybe 12 hours of her life, that's it. Otherwise it was me and it was the sister and it was the best friend turning her, moving her, helping with oral care, doing at, at the very beginning of hospice, getting her up, no bedside commode, you know, that should have been ordered. Uh, but anyway, you look back at those things and that's how you learn for the future. Um, this is what I would like next time for my loved one or family member. I'm looking at a hummingbird, you guys. There's a hummingbird right in front of me. And they rarely come where I'm at, so it's really nice. 
there's a lot of things you're going to reflect on. It's a extremely emotional, traumatizing at times experience or not, or perfectly peaceful, no what no no hiccups whatsoever experience. You just don't know. But just try not to beat yourself up about things like, oh, I should have, or I wish I would have. I mean, we all, look at me, years later, we all say those sorts of things, but that's normal. And it's okay. Um, you know, the, the thing about, we don't want them to suffer any age, any patient at home or um, in an adult family home or a nursing home or hospice. We, we don't want them to suffer. So there are ways and things that can be done to help that person. Absolutely. I have one last example of what I would not want done for a loved one. And this patient had cancer. This person had cancer, also a friend though. And he did have a, a port here because of the chemotherapy was being given here. When the chemo wasn't working anymore and the cancer had metastasized all over, he decided he wanted to die at home. Um, but he would like, if things got too difficult or out of control, he, he really wanted hospice. Um, if it became too difficult for his wife to care for him. But um, in that case, she decided he wanted to have, she, he should have a natural death. There were uh, no narcotics. There was a lot of marijuana. Um, she didn't want to use the port like for IV narcotics or for him to be taken even to the ER, get that pain stabilized and under control and go back to the house then or have somebody come out to the house just to come and check out things. Um, like I said, you can decide what you want and your loved ones can decide too, but it's so important to talk about it ahead of time. Um, because in his case, there's some suffering that went on, uh, but that um, family believed that this is the dying process. There are cultures that believe this and we don't intervene is their feeling on it. Um, if that's what the person wants, then that's what the person should get. But it's just something to make sure that is written down, that is talked about ahead of time, that's told to their doctor, their nurse practitioner, their PA, and other family members, not just one. Just my thoughts on it, having gone through the end of life experience. Well, I hope this was helpful. If it was, I would appreciate it if you could share it with somebody who might benefit from this. Um, and and give it a like. I hate to ask for likes and subscribes, but there's no way that these videos that we make go out to anybody. They just sit where they're at and um, nobody ever benefits from them if maybe this information would be helpful. That is the sad thing about the algorithm of YouTube. We do everything we can, but they're the ones who decide whether or not people get to see it or not. Oh, I just realized I don't have my microphone on. Darn it. This is pretty close. I hope that you've been able to hear me okay. Please put any comments or questions down below. And thank you so much for watching.